Welcome back to Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn. Last time we cleared out a large batch of the nobles' forces before realizing the central army was right on us and we had to pull a hasty retreat. This time I'm going to get right into it because there's going to be a lot of cutscenes before this part. Some big stuff happens for the war in this chapter. The Apostle Sanaki, Empress of the Benyan Empire, does not wish war with the Lagoons and searches feverishly for a peaceful resolution. However, many Imperial Senators see the war not only as a means to expand their own influence, but also as a convenient opportunity to exterminate the Lagoons once and for all. These ambitious Senators meet with Vice Minister Lacan and vigorously advocate a full-scale war. Having seen their homeland invaded, Benyan's citizens desiring peace are now few and far between. Against the Apostle's wishes, Benyan's military is now fully committed to the war with the Lagoons. Zelgius easily escapes the talons of the bird tribes meant to delay him and the Central Army. He arrives at the Sesto Plains to reinforce his weakened allies. The Lagoos' forces are surprised by the sudden appearance of this new enemy and seek counsel from Ranulf of Gallia. Ranulf orders a retreat with all speed, thus avoiding a full-on engagement with the Central Army. General Zelgius chooses not to pursue the fleeing Gallian army. Instead, he orders his army to hold position on the eastern banks of the Riban. Divided by the river, the two armies are deadlocked, able to do little more than glare at one another in hatred. So we have a stalemate going on now. During this chapter I might explain why I love part 3 so much, at least most of it. Part 3, to sum up, is one of the few times, very few times in the Fire Emblem series that I feel that you get the sense of an actual war going on. The Fire Emblem series is really all about war, and yet I feel like Radiant Dawn is one of the only ones where the war actually feels real. In many other Fire Emblem games, it feels more like you're just a small band of heroes going on a quest, while a war just happens to be going on in the background. Even Path of Radiant still gave me that feeling. In Radiant Dawn though, you get to see both sides enact strategies. You get to see them gain and lose ground. You get to see the perspective of the people on one side who want peace and those who don't. This will get really interesting after this chapter, but in general I feel like Radiant Dawn does a really good job of making you actually feel like you're part of a larger war, which is something that a lot of Fire Emblem games just aren't good at in my opinion. So yeah, we saw Zelgius earlier. He is definitely very competent. that kind of thing is not reflected on his image in the cutscene at all. Well, you might notice that a certain ally of ours was not with Chiban there. Hey, it's Rayson! Glad to see you again. So now all three of the Heron siblings have made their appearances, and here's Janeth. Raisin and Tiban kind of grew up together, so it makes sense he'd be worried about him. A 
And this is one of my favourite lines in this entire game. So, yep, I told you the backstab count will return. Surely you saw this coming? I did it. I really did it. Of course they were. In the extended script, there's a slight exchange between Janeth and Orki here that um, the one translation blog sums up as, but we didn't lose that badly, okay? Which is kind of funny. And you only saw him, I think, like once or twice? Maybe three times if Tanith died in the final chapter, which obviously isn't canon. That's why I decided to show that scene in extra footage, by the way, because Zelgius becomes a lot more important in this game. He must be extremely strong if he can take a hit from Tiban and keep going. I mean, Tiban is one of the few flyers in this game who can take crossbow shots and shrug them off. Well, that's ominous. Zelgius seems like a pretty honourable guy, but... What was that he meant? Nassala may have done something even worse than sell you into slavery in the last game. Just when he was starting to redeem himself, too. This conveniently prevents us from receiving significant aid from Phoenicius for the rest of this war, so... I guess from a plot standpoint, they kind of did this to make the whole situation a little less complicated. One less army to deal with. Phoenicius still exists, but their army is... Like, the forces are nowhere near capable of assisting us nearly as much as they would have been. Thankfully though, Tiban is still here and he's still fighting. And he's pretty much an entire army in his own right. I just realised the whole thing about we can't let our king leave his country because who knows what might happen may have been foreshadowing this happening. It's a good thing Kanegus is back in Gallia to prevent that kind of thing from happening to them. And this moment right here, this is going to be my favourite plan of this entire war. I love the setup for this chapter so much. Obviously Scrimmy is going to be in the group that does the frontal assault, because that's just what he does best. Lanolf is going to flank them. We'll see just how they can get across the river like that um, very soon. That almost sounds like a Dynasty Warriors thing. I love how Soren considers Zelgius a separate factor. They've got the terrain and Zelgius in their factor. He's pretty much right as well.
At least Squimira is receptive to Soren's plans now. And Soren's still a master of snark. So, this is going to be our role in this. I, this is why I love this plan so much. It's just really brilliant on Soren's part. The only downside is that means they're luring Zelgius to us. We'll probably have to run before he gets here. And here's the thing, even if Zelgius... Because I feel like Zelgius would probably understand that we're a diversion. And that we want him away from the front lines. But he doesn't really have a choice. The Senators do outrank him, and they are pretty much snobbish idiots who are also cowards. They'll scream for him to come and aid them the moment they're in danger. Scrimmier is learning slightly. And so we have the base. Now, hopefully I'll get through the base relatively quickly because there's actually going to be a cutscene. I mean like an actual fully animated cutscene before this chapter begins. And there's quite a lot that I have to say about that cutscene. So first, base conversations, no items this time. Thankfully, we still have enough Hawks left to do the whole airdrop trick. I still can't stress enough how much I love this plan. This is my favourite Soren plan across both games. And Squimir is actually starting to become quite a fan of Soren. I guess he admires strength and, um... The ability to make strategies that win you wars is certainly a kind of strength. So this uh, this thing is actually a little bit more built up to in the extended script from what I've heard. There's a few more interactions between Scrimmier and Soren in that script. Yeah, I guess Soren's a bit less of a jerk than he used to be. He's definitely not antagonizing our Lagoo's allies for no reason, like he did all the way back in Path of Radiance Chapter 8. Another reason why I wanted to play Path of Radiance before this game. A lot of characters really develop through that one, and you really see the result of that development here. Maybe. And that's all we get from the base conversations. So let's go ahead and check out the bargains. Draco Shield, Concoction, Arm Scroll, and this thing. So this lets you learn the skill Flourish, which is an incredibly bizarre skill. I don't think I'll be buying it because I rarely find it useful. What it does is it's thankfully a command activation like Gamble, so it's not always on. But when you use it, you attack with half might. Not half damage, half might. So for example, if I can just go and uh, show someone here, uh, Ike here has an attack power of, uh, it's easier if someone has an even number. Okay, yeah, that, that's perfect. Titania has an attack power of 20 with the Steel Poleaxe. If she uses Flourish, she'd attack with 20 power. Which, considering most enemies at this point have almost 20 defense, will barely do much damage to anything. So, Flourish is a very strange skill. I suppose it can be alright if you want to get disarmed or something. Or if you have an enemy that you really don't want to kill, but you still want to attack for some reason. Again, there are very few situations where that's useful, so I don't know. I don't really like Flourish all that much. We do have a very expensive Draco Shield and Arm Scroll, but I think I'll pass those up with a Spectre card. You know what? It's actually pretty expensive, though, and I think we can get another one in Bargains later. Somebody in the comments did mention to me that Magic Cards are actually a very effective way of... of doing the thing that Ike needs to do in 3-7. 
I kind of prefer using a Wind Edge, but it might be not a bad idea to get the uh, Spectre card as an insurance policy. But I think now that you've started selling it, she's probably going to keep selling it for a long time. The Armoury has pretty much the exact same stock that it used to, so nothing to really show there. Can anyone... Okay, yeah, now, suddenly, a whole ton of people can support. So, I can support almost everyone in the initial Ground Mercenaries, but I'm going to obviously support with Sorin, because I need to do this for a base conversation at the very end of the game. And, uh, Dark Affinity is the second best next to Earth, it's generally considered, so an Icon Sauron support is very useful for the two of them. Now, let's see, Rolf and Miss can't rank up their support. Can Rolf support someone else other than Shinnon? You know, him with the support with Oscar is not a bad idea. Okay, I, I should first consider who do I support Mia with, because I might want to use her quite a bit, so... This seems a little strange, but maybe Mia and Gatrix. Okay, Nephany and Brom are still supporting, and the only other person she can support is Heather. But I'm probably going to be using Heather for a lot longer than I'm using Brom, so you know what, I'm going to swap over the support to Heather, and I think I'll do your support last, because it doesn't really matter, I keep you away from the front lines anyway. Oscar though, Oscar's support is extremely useful. But I can't do Miss because she's already supporting Void, and I can't... Ah, oh, that's unfortunate. Oscar's a really good support partner. If I could support him with Mia, that would be good, but maybe Bryce, I guess? There are a lot better support partners for Oscar in this chapter. Uh, Titania probably needs a support partner too. I kind of wish she could support Oscar. But I think for now she's stuck not supporting anyone. As for items, I think Ike's fine for now. I think Tani is also fine. Har, I would like to give him a Polax. I kind of forgot to give him a Polax last time, and I almost feel like uh, that was a dumb decision. Still, Polax is going to be pretty useful for him. Um, definitely coin. You are in desperate need of a new javelin, so let's go ahead and take one, and I might as well take out a skilled Great Lance while I'm here. Mia is probably fine on items for now. Do I have any? Although your Wind Edge is a little bit down, might as well take an extra one. Rice is fine. Heather, I think, is also fine. If I'm not using Brom from now on, I might as well convoy all of his weapons. How about Gaytree? Gaytree might as well take an extra hand axe. Your other weapons are pretty good. Wait a minute. That is B rank. Gaytree can use the killer axe. So I'm actually going to go ahead and give Gaytree that. Although I kind of like giving that to Har as well. And Har might be doing a lot of work in this chapter, even though I don't really plan on using him a ton. Hmm. Let's swap out one of your steel axes for a killer axe. Soren is, is fine once again, and Rolf is also fine. Shinnon. Do I have any better bows for Shinnon? Doesn't look like it. Are there any bows that Rolf can trade over? I will be getting an extremely good bow uh, in just one more chapter, so I can probably afford to swap the... You know what, Rolf doesn't really need the killer bow. The Sky Sentinel bow has enough might, but he really doesn't need crits that much. So that's good. Miss could probably do with an extra healing staff, but I think I'm fine for the moment. Oscar's fine. Okay, that's good. Now, manage. Award experience. So there's a few people who I want to level up with bonus experience here. Firstly, Gaytree. Gaytree will definitely benefit from that. That should be cap speed. Yes, it is. So that's very, very good. And... Hmm, don't know if I should do that. Mia... You know, I just realised the majority of the Grail Mercenaries get better level ups on average via bonus experience um, after they've capped one stat. So you know what? Let's actually cap off Mia with a bit of bonus experience. Strength is very good. Skill's not quite capped. Once she's capped that, I can bonus experience her strength up even more, even though that's almost capped too. So Mia's almost reaching the... I forgot your magic cap was that low. That's kind of a shame. Uh, Oscar, yeah, he's better off getting that level up during the chapter itself. I'll certainly be most experiencing Rolf later, but not quite yet. Tanya, nah, she's probably better served leveling up normally. Soren obviously wants to level up with bonus experience at this point. I kind of prefer defense, but extra luck is kind of nice too. Har is only... I think I'll leave half for now. Nope, let's not both screw Tiliana, although let me see. I can level up a few times. Let's give Nephany one more level up. 
Because, yeah, she's definitely at the point where she's getting way, uh, some pretty bad level ups from regular experience, but that was not the greatest in terms of level ups anyway. At least that means better healing from Imbue when she gets it. No, that's way too much bonus experience from that level. I'll leave her as she is. I think I'll leave Ike for now, too. So, that seems like, unless there's anything that I can sell. No, I think I'm pretty much good. So, let's move out, and like I said, it's time for a cutscene. By the way, if you haven't figured it out by now, this is Zelgius's theme. And by the way, this is not going to be a Fog of War chapter, don't worry. And here we go. Cutscene time. The band's marching halfway across the river all day. There's no point in waiting. Oh, well, <laughs> enemy will spot him soon. Then it's time to fight. You should go. Don't remind me. I hate flying. Anyway, give the word, will you? No need. Our friends heard every word. Screaming his voice isn't bad. Ah, finally, it's time. I've had enough of sitting around. To wing, brothers! Keep up with me if you can! <laughs> what is bad is that? <sighs> Tivar will forever be infamous for that line. His first line didn't sound that bad, but his second, yeah, that was cringeworthy. And that is a meme in the fandom, by the way, to Wing Brothers, just because of how terrible that line sounded. I love how they capture the feel of just a gigantic hawk suddenly landing right in front of you. elsewhere. Keep them engaged until I return. Yes, sir. to drop in unannounced. We thought it best to hunt the strongest prey first. Of course. Interesting maneuver. Will you draw your blade? I trust you know who you face, Zelgius, commander of this army. If you're not worthy of fighting me, then you are only wasting my time. On Ronald. Right hand to Gallia's future king. Will that do? We shall see. I will accept your challenge. And you're ready. Shaky voice acting aside, that's a really cool cutscene. I love that scene. I wish more Fire Emblem games would have animated big battle scenes like that. That's just, it's, that is insanely cool. Also, fun fact, um, also there's this guy. I'll talk more about him once I get to the chapter itself. But fun fact, so Zelgius' voice actor in that cutscene, you might recognize that voice if you played other Wii games by Nintendo. Because the voice actor who plays Zelgius in this game is also the narrator of Kirby's epic yarn. I declare a cake-eating duel. Yeah. 
Now you can't unhear that. And this center is acting pretty much how you'd expect of one. I kind of like this boss though, because he hates the senators as much as we do. But that's the power of rescue dropping with flyers. So the plan. This is going to be one of the most unique chapters in the entire series. Our objective is not to destroy the enemy themselves, but to destroy their supplies. This line's also kind of weird, and I'll explain why when we get to the chapter itself. I feel like the developers wanted to include this as a bonus experience condition, but then realized it would be too complicated to program. This line also alludes to some bonus experience conditions. So that thing about the senators, a lot of people worry that you get a game over if you kill them, it's just that they're worth bonus experience if they survive. So, we want to keep them alive, but there's also something unique about that too. Anyway, next I will begin... Well, we went from one of my least favourite chapters in Part 3 to one of my absolute favourite chapters in Part 3. I can't wait to get started on this one. 